Imagine being one of the creators of Siri, watching your invention transform from a simple voice assistant into a worldwide phenomenon. What does it feel like to shape the future of human-computer interaction? We interviewed Baba Khojat, CTO of Cognizant and original inventor of Siri's natural language technology, to learn more about the past, present and future of artificial intelligence. I'm Philip, co-founder of the Engage Institute. We offer innovative training solutions for insurance companies worldwide. Do you struggle to capture the knowledge of your experts? Contact us. We'll record engaging interviews with them for you to share. Now, join me as we delve deeper into today's topic together. Today on the show, we have the great pleasure to welcome Babak Hojad. Hi, Babak. How are you doing? Good. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I mean, it's very early where you are right now in California, right? Yeah, it's not too bad at 6.15. It's fine. The sun's coming out. Right. <laughs> Babak, you're the CTO of Cognizance. It's a global technology company. And you are also the founder of something that a lot of our Apple users know very well, Siri. Hey, Siri. Is that your baby? <laughs> uh, I was technically the founder of a precursor to Siri, a company called Dejima. I was the main inventor of the natural language technology. And the technology there and the team started Siri. So in some ways, I was the main inventor of the natural language technology within Siri. Now, since that first incarnation, a lot has changed within Siri. As I was saying that name, I had my iPad just on the right hand side that reacted and was ready to... to <laughs> so did mine, to actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I apologize on behalf of uh, everyone who worked on it that it's starting to become an annoyance more than helpful. Hopefully it'll get overhauled soon and uh, we'll get more generative AI into Siri and it'll make it much more useful. <laughs> going to talk about that. So first, um, what do you think about what's happened in the past years with AI? It came as a huge surprise. Even those who were involved in building it we did not expect this level of powerful emergent intelligent behavior to come out of scaling this kind of an approach. So for many of us, it's been a wonderful few years of amazement. And when we're talking about the emergent behavior, that really means that much of what you see in the power of GPT-4 or Gemini or Claude and so forth was not programmed into it. It kind of absorbed that through learning. For example, the fact that it can understand multiple languages or translate or do some reasoning or math, that's just by virtue of scaling and learning to predict the next word in a sequence of words. So it's just amazing that you can do that. We all kind of had a hunch that some simple first principles at scale would result in this kind of intelligent behavior, but most of us thought it would happen much later. And I don't think most of us didn't think that it would uh, be this simple, quite frankly. So we are too simple. Basically, we cracked intelligence. And it's not even intelligence, it's just statistics. Is that what intelligence is about? First of all, I must say that it, it's some facets of intelligence, not all of them. One glaringly missing facet of intelligence that as humans or higher order animals we have that is missing in these systems is learning, like online learning. While they learn their behavior, that training happens offline and then we kind of fix the models and then use them going forward. We can do some level of fine tuning, but that's really not changing its core belief system. So there are certain things that are still missing. I don't want for people to think that, you know, we've cracked it, we're done. No, there's much, much more to do. However, many facets of intelligence do manifest themselves in these systems from creativity to higher order reasoning, abstractions that are similar to human abstractions. The most important part of all of this, natural language processing seems to now be a solved problem. So yeah, that's kind of where we are right now with the technology. Is the basis statistics? Yeah. I mean, that I think was pretty clear. There's no, I mean, there's still, we can still choose to be mystical about intelligence and think that there's something else also going on in the background. But I think that's mystical thinking. That something else is probably something we still don't know that we will discover and be able to add. But that genie is has a smaller and smaller roles. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so you, do you think that you're creating a new being? A new being. 
Well, it's not embodied. From a biological perspective, we're used to a being coming to life and having some built-in perspective or architecture, but then being exposed to the world and learning a lot of things. And it's difficult to draw a distinction between what is learned and what is inherited. We don't quite know. But that's kind of the way. So that embodiment is a very important part. That is missing right now. These systems are too large and they don't do online learning, or at least not that easily. So is this a being? Maybe not. Does it have a personality? It has many personalities. In fact, that's, that's also one of the fascinating, interesting things about generative AI is that you can ask it to act as this persona or that persona, and it'll take it on and, and be that uh, other personality, which is just amazing. It has not all, but many facets of human intelligence are manifested through these models. But, you know, we're at the stage with these systems that we were, like, if the analogy is computing, computers used to fill a whole, like, room. And they were done in a very certain way with lamps, and they were error-prone, and programming them was very difficult, and they were very energy-hungry. We're kind of at that stage with generative AI. Oh, a gosh. lot of optimization can still happen. A lot of tweaks can still happen. So there's a lot of room for incremental improvements. I would like to think that there's also a lot of room for rethinking altogether the approach. So while this is a proof of existence, we know that there's at least one path to achieving this kind of intelligence. There might be other paths to take as well. It's good news that we know it's possible. And so that gives us hope that we might be able to use other approaches too and achieve the same and more. So that's the way I look at it right now. I like the way you say we have to rethink and not actually that you were even surprised of how fast the whole thing went. But because of this speed, do you think education will have to be rethought? Are, are we humans going to learn the same thing in 10 years from now or should we learn something else? Such a great question. It's actually, it, it goes to the heart of the matter. The fact is, for the first time, we've been able to create these intelligent systems that for many of the tasks that we take on, they're sufficient, and in some cases, better. You can think of them as knowledge workers in a box. You can literally tell them in your language what you expect them to do and have them do it autonomously. Because of their level of abstraction, you can rely on them to know what to do, even if they're in situations that you've not declared and defined for them. The implications are huge. For starters, I think there will be societal implications. We're scratching the surface right now. It's only been a year or two since the advent of these systems. We're scratching the surface of applicability. And we're kind of bound by our imagination right now as to where we can use them. But there will be more and more use cases and they will start encroaching on what we have defined as our exclusive domain of operation. They could be put to ill use, which is also a huge risk. So for all of that, our best weapon is two things. One is making use of them extensively for the good versus the evil, but also to learn about how to live alongside these systems and in a society that is impacted heavily across the board by these systems. So education is very, very important and kind of neglected right now. I, it, it's kind of deja vu a little bit. Like 15 years ago when social media came out, it was let loose on society. It had a huge impact everywhere. And what was neglected was the aspect of education, partly because people didn't know how to deal with it and what the implications would be. But those few countries that actually took it on to educate at a young age how to deal with social media and what the implications are have fared better than those who haven't. And I think the implications of generative AI and AI as a whole will be even larger. And I see us neglecting that educational side again right now. That is important. The more we invest in educating our kids and us in upskilling and in, in understanding these systems and how to deal with them, the easier this transition is going to be. So how do you imagine education in five to 10 years concretely? Kids go to school. What do they do? No math, no history, no language learning. They all speak to AI. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be that way. For some things, yes. Like the analogy is the slide rule. I remember when I went to college, the older guys who were like four years ahead of me had a whole course in college on learning how to use the slide rule. 
And one time I sat down with one of them, I'm like, how do you do logarithms with this thing? And it was very complex. And I could see why it took a course to learn it. We don't need it. We use a calculator. We've stayed a step ahead of that. Like we can teach our kids what is the purpose of a logarithm earlier because they can just punch it into their computers or their cell phones and you, they can get the results out of that. The other an analogy is chess. There is this flip side of this as well, which is, okay, we have our machines that are better than us in many cases in doing things such as playing chess. Chess is more popular than it's ever been. And humans play it all the time. Sometimes humans are augmented by machines and sometimes they're not, and they're not even allowed to use the machine and they're they're playing it anyway. And it's fun. But that's for fun, that's not for business. So basically, they're what you're saying, it's nice to see humans painting, drawing, playing chess, but that's not doing business. That's right. When When you think about it though, these systems currently, the way they're trained, they're trained on the corpus of what's reflected on the internet as far as what humanity has been able to produce. They're very good at interpolating that. So within that domain of all possible arts, for example, you, they can be creative. They can create a, an artwork that is an interpolation of a few of those artworks in some very creative way. Our role now is to push the boundaries of that and move outside of that. And there will be a give and take. Like as we become more creative in how we produce and create in the world. And part of that is also how we use generative AI and AI systems. And we're pushing those boundaries. And that's then again reflected in the internet and the corpus of data that we have. And our AI systems are better for that. And this give and take will continue. Now, is there a limit to this? Sure. Currently, we are the masters. We are defining where and how we use this very powerful tool. If at some point society decides that for some of its functions, it wants to defer to AI systems because they're simply better. I don't see a problem with that if it's done correctly, but that could happen. When is AI going to take uh, over your job? My job? Yeah. I mean, we're yeah. those of us in AI are our, our, our worst enemies. I already use Copilot for writing code. I use GPT-4. I run ideas by it. Soon, hopefully, Claude 3 seems to be a little bit better. I'm more productive for that, and I get much more done. It's only when we give these systems autonomy and responsibility, and those are two things that society has to decide whether or not they want to imbue these systems with, is when my job is going to go away. And I wouldn't shut the door on that. You know, I'll be controversial and say it right now. You know, look at self-driving cars, right? Less people die. So you have to weigh it against, oh, people are losing jobs. Very important. People has, have to have jobs. People dying. So how do you balance the two? And maybe there's a happy medium there. Same thing goes for generative AI. There, there are many uses of AI systems where the frequency of decision-making means that you want to use an automated autonomous system because it saves lives. Why not use it there? We will see a generative AI as an army general, for example. Oh, we're seeing it even today. You know, the cat is out of the bag. If we don't do it for our military, the other guy is going to do it. And what is our best way to stop that. Unfortunately, it's to actually make use of more powerful AI systems. Th th that could be a race to the bottom. On the other hand, you look at the world and as humans, we've not been the best decision makers in society and environment and many other cases as well. So as an optimist, it might be that augmenting ourselves with these systems and in some cases, deferring to them on decision-making would make the world a better place. You uh, said augmenting <laughs> ourselves, uh, Babak, but uh, we, they could also replace us. So that's a question that uh, I see, like in society so far, the progress is done with computers. All these systems, they first help the blue colors with a very heavy work. And then computers help us go faster. Now, AI, as you said, is faster or better in many aspects of white collar jobs, etc. It could po potentially replace most of the jobs. So it's going very, very fast. It's not that we have 50 year transition and our societies, our politicians, they're not techies like you. They don't see the future of this thing. So how can they bring our societies and prepare them for a future we don't even know how it's, it's going to be like? 
There's good news there as well. I mean, the bad news is that it's rolling out very, very rapidly. It's too fast. Like this transition is very, very fast and will leave a lot of people in its wake scrambling to find a new role. Yes, that's true. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. These AI systems understand language. So they're a leveler. Unlike other technologies that have been disruptive, where you had to educate yourself like on electronics or writing code or creating a web page. And without that, you were you would fall behind. Here, this system understands your language. And I'm not just talking English, it's your native language. So in that sense, the barrier to entry is much lower in using these systems and empowering yourself. It's a level. Uh -huh. That's a good thing for society. And it actually helps maybe mitigate some of that speed of this thing rolling out. So that's one thing I would say. Every time a technology has come along that has made us more productive, it's made us busier. That transition has always resulted in us having to do more. We're again. always the ones keeping the control and having the brain over the tech. Yeah, that is correct. And, and, and that's the difference now. Yeah, yeah. Depends on us whether and how much of the reins we're going to give to AI-based systems, they're good, but at least currently they're not that good. I wouldn't let them call the shots on everything and I would not no. let them be autonomous. And also society as a whole is simply not ready for that. If an autonomous car is in a crash, who's liable for that? That simple question doesn't have an answer right now. Maybe our grandkids will figure this out and society will be more ready to pay a salary to AI systems and hold them responsible. That would mean that we've brought them in as part of the society, not completely replacing us, but as part of the society. That is just not there right now. That's a transition that is cultural and will take several ger generations to get there. And even at that point, my sense is that we, it will not be at a point where we basically sit back and everything is run by AI systems. We will just be more empowered. And, and on that one, what would be amazing is that the, the little boy or little girl or, or teenager in any part of the world for once, now that when you create a company, you don't have the resources to create the website, to create the database, to create the design. Now, I think that's what you were aiming at is now we have it. Every single yes. person could be an incredible entrepreneur being able to do. It. So I get the goosebumps thinking about that. <laughs> Just one thing I would like to jump on. You mentioned insurance before. What kind of use cases do you see for insurance or banking? How is that going to impact these companies in the next two or three years? Any company in any use case can be impacted. And these impacts range from just when you think of an insurance company, you have a number of decision points in insurance. Underwriting is a decision point, for example, uh, actuarial and, and so forth. And so uh, for every point in that workflow of, a deci uh, uh, of making decisions that lead to setting a premium, for example, for an insurance or deciding whether or not to insure, you can augment and in some cases replace those decision makers with AI systems. And the way to do so always is to establish what is the KPI, what is the outcomes that you care about. So in insurance, for example, let's say we want to do property insurance and what we want to do is to maximize the likelihood that the customer is going to buy this insurance package from us. So that's one KPI that's important to an insurance company. We also want to minimize the risk. So we can't just give away this thing at a very low premium because there's risk involved. So we want to measure and minimize the risk for that. And there might be other KPI as well. We want to be responsible in the way we're insuring this thing. So the, the ethics of it might be another KPI that we bring in. So if we define and declare those, then we can actually build and use generative AI systems that are optimizing, helping us optimize against those KPI. And we give them a tool set. We give them the information. For example, here's the area where this property is, and here's the information about it, and here's what we know. Let's say aerial photography of where the property lies and all that. And here's what we can do. So there are several templates, for example, for this uh, insurance contract that we want to sign. There is a level of premium to be set, multiple different degrees of freedom that we have in countering or giving some sort of a deal to our customer. 
And we have the AI give us suggestions around that and mm -hmm. also predict what the outcome is going to be. So the AI system is going to say, for example, okay, for this particular pro property, for this customer, I think we should do this. And here's the template we should use. And here are the changes we need to make to the policies. And here's how we think we should present this to the customer. And if we do and that, maybe then... How, here is how we're going to simplify the, the insurance policy for the end exactly, user so that he or she exactly. can understand it. And explain it to the needed. customer. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Again, we have the luxury of having a system that understands and can produce natural language. Like the AI thinks that the likelihood of closing this deal, winning this, is this much. And here's mm -hmm. how much revenue we're going to make after a year or two years from this. And here's the risk exposure that we have. And so if that's acceptable, let's go with it. If, not, if it's not acceptable, now we interact with the system. Like, what if we change the policy this way? How, how about if we increase the premium this much? How about we message the customer in this particular way? And so th that interaction is also important until we reach the, the decision that we want to make. And then we track it, obviously. It's going to be across or completely inside all the processes of an insurance banking company yeah. or any others. What about the energy consumption? Because apparently that's going to use a lot of energy and we're probably going to use even more. Is it an issue with AI? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a huge issue right now. I, I was reading an article yesterday that the old clunky, clunky power grid in the U.S. is not even keeping up with the energy demand. And, and, and a lot of that energy demand okay. is coming from data centers that are being used for AI training. Really? So, wow. yes, training these models, like the first training, it's a one-time thing, but it is very, very expensive. That's the biggest part. What, what, of what does it mean very expensive to train? It, it's in the tens of millions of dollars to train one model. It, it, it's, it's an offline batch process. It takes a while until it's fully trained. And it takes a lot of energy and water. Say it takes a while, like a few okay. weeks. Yeah. And, and, I'm not, and that's when we're training a system without the failures of, oh, false starts, or we made a mistake here. <laughs> so there's a lot of lead up and experimentation that gets to a point where we start the, the training process. So we need to account for that as well. Um, but in the longer run, the m biggest energy consumption is in just running inference on these models. So hosting, for example, a GPT-4 or a Gemini for the masses to hit. Like people will be sending mm -hmm. queries from all over the world and we need to just run these queries through these models. And hosting those is also a big energy sink. And however, there's good news there as well. Positive you are all the time. You always come with a nice positive <laughs> side. We have no choice but to be positive. <laughs> the good news is that the trend currently is for smaller, more powerful models. So eh. the same size models that were useless two years ago today are the equivalent of GPT 3.5. I'm talking open source models. So we're, we're learning how to optimize uh, these models to the point where they're smaller, they take less energy to train. And so that's part of the good news. The other good news in all of this in the longer run is our own brains. Our brains are very, very energy efficient, extremely energy efficient. Mm -hmm. Like we run on what, like 1,500, 2,000 calories a day. This is, this is nothing compared to having to run a huge generative AI model. And so we do have at least proof of existence of a model that's very, very powerful, that is very, very low energy. So are there other substrates that can be used, other approaches that can be used, variations to the architectures that can be used that could give us huge improvements in the energy consumption of these systems? Hopefully, with help from AI systems, we'll find them. Uh, and Babak, you're, you're comparing our energy consumption to AI, but there I just wonder, we, we can create cells, we can create tissues, we can manipulate DNA. What about one day we basically build, instead of chips and wires, we start building a biological eye? Could that happen? Maybe. Let's hope. At least the technology right now is very, very far from that. It's very difficult for us to control these systems, biological systems. It's 
Like when you're doing back propagation on an artificial neural network, which is the basis of generative AI systems, you're making minute changes to the weights of these connections between the neurons. And doing something at that level of accuracy in an organic tissue is today impossible. So interesting area of inquiry, I, I think years and years before we can actually do that, just from my limited exposure to that part of science. We talked a lot about the metaverse two years ago. In the meantime, it's maturing, but we don't speak a lot about it anymore. We have all these goggles and devices to see 3D uh, worlds, AR, VR. Uh, is there any link between AI and the metaverse? We can control avatars, and now we can have avatars that understand language. So for games, definitely, it seems to be a very obvious use case there. We can generate now. I'm sure you've seen video generation like Sora. It just amazing. blows your mind how amazing that thing is. So just imagine if we could do that in 3D. Again, it takes a lot of power and a lot of compute capacity to be, do, be able to do that. But if we were able to do that, then we can actually generate these um, uh, very realistic, continuous images that we can operate in the metaverse. The metaverse, to me, is interesting. I'm not quite sure if we have had our iPhone moment with the metaverse just yet. It, it, it's still kind of a technology in search of general use cases. It's a bit clunky and awkward. So there are still kinks to be worked out there. AI will have a part in that. I don't know if it's like an essential part. A lot of engineering can also serve as adding functionality into the metaverse. So I don't know if it's that critical to the metaverse, but definitely could play a part. Actually, one part of it could be also to generate the images. Uh, that what we see nowadays is more game-like, but we have seen AIs which are able to generate very, very realistic uh, images in real time. So this is, I, I think, one part of it. Definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, on the fly, generating, generating and controlling these images would make the metaverse even more fascinating. And I think, at least from an entertainment perspective, that could be a, a very strong direction for sure. How could quantum computers change the game, or can they? Quantum computers, the... Bad news is we still don't have a scaled quantum computer, and there are many still fundamental problems uh, that we need to solve to be able to build quantum computers at scale. We've been able to create quantum computers, qubits, and superposition them at smaller scale. So that's the good news is that at a small scale, it's there. But scaling them to a point where they're effective and useful for AI-based systems, we're still far from that. And and we've been five years away from that for many years now. <laughs> so I don't know when that breakthrough is going to come. Uh, there's been incremental progress, but we, we're not there yet. However, we know theoretically that in the uh, quantum world, the order of doing search operations is just much, much faster, which means we could have systems that are more efficient and they're learning faster to learn and update themselves. And our machine learning algorithms will then suddenly be able to do things that are considered impossible right now. I mean, we hear about some of the implications on, for example, cri cryptography and so forth. So yeah, it's been exciting. I looked into it several years ago and I got very excited about the prospects, but at the same time, kind of skeptical about how imminent it is. And I think mm -hmm. we're still far from the point where they could be applied and practical. And you just mentioned briefly cryptography. Could they have an impact on the blockchain, on Web3, on the security? And this is outside of my expertise. I, I, I believe so, simply because search is going to be so much faster. A lot of our um, crypto crypt cryptography encryption, uh, things we do with blockchain and so forth, rely on search for, for example, you know, very large prime numbers. Uh, because in reasonable time, you can't find the prime number, you can't crack the code. 
but with an effectively quantum computer, you might be able to actually crack the code because the, the time to search for it is much faster in, in quantum because of the superposition. It's almost like linear versus uh, exponential time. Exponential. And that, that, that could be a huge, huge difference. So there's, there's some concern. On the other hand, there is this whole field of quantum cryptography, which talks about how we can actually now use quantum computers to encrypt which would make it even more impossible. So there's points and counterpoints there. Again, I'm the AI expert. I'm much less of an expert here. Fact to something you really love and like and know, what is missing to build the famous AGI? What do we have to do to reach it? AGI is this slippery kind of definition by many standards we've already hit it. If Alan Turing was alive today, by his standard of uh, the Turing test, it's been passed. So maybe he would say, yeah, we have it. What is his test? His test was basically if you're sitting in a different room and you're interacting with a panel of humans and machines and you don't know which one is a human, which one is a machine, and you're interacting through, let's say, typing things in, so the interface isn't belying the fact that it's a human or a machine. If you can't figure out whether it's a human or a machine, then that machine is intelligent. When you read the paper, when, when he talks about this, it's like this is a super smart guy that came up with the fundamentals of AI as well as computing and everything. And you can tell that he's just setting a standard for now just so he has a definition and he can get to the real thing. So I don't even know if spend enough time thinking about that. But for the longest time, that was the standard. And that is met today, easily met. Like th th these generative AI systems can trick you into th believing you're interacting with the human. So if that was the definition for AGI, we're there already. I would like to think that AGI is more like alchemy in that... There's a lot of facets of intelligence, not just bounded by what we see in humans, that uh, we want to strive to achieve. And some of them we have achieved, many of them we haven't. If the standard is human intelligence, online learning, being able to change your belief with one example is something that our generative AI models today cannot do. So that's one aspect that we're not there yet. These systems are therefore not embodied which means a generative AI model into a robot and have it quote unquote born and learn its environment and its belief system be very much within the context of what it's experienced. That we simply can't do for physical reasons as well as uh, algorithmic reasons. We currently don't have the technology to allow these systems to self-replicate. So if you imagine, let's say we're on Mars and we want an intelligent system there to be able to create its own kind and replicate it and just you know, populate Mars. We're so far from that. Like there's so much to be invented to be able to do something like that. So these are just a few examples of areas where we're not there. Back on the uh, population on Mars, maybe AI will or AGI will be able to create a system which is better than sexuality to uh, <laughs> create the next generation. Yeah, I don't know about that. Having worked in evolutionary computation for much of my career, I, I can tell you that that kind of reproduction, first of all, it has evolved several times in nature independently. And it seems to be very, very powerful. So having different facets, different kinds of intelligence kind of mix what they have and produce offspring that has a little bit of this parent and a little bit of that parent, that seems to be very effective in creating systems that can survive a, a, a varying environment. So I don't know about that, but maybe. Depends on what how you define sexuality, I guess. <laughs> We're nearing the end of this very interesting discussion. One thing, you, you have a... Um... Uh, your latest project now, I understood that your your company has uh, unveiled an advanced artificial intelligence lab. Do you want to tell us briefly what this is? What is your role there? What do you want to achieve? Yeah, I'm very proud of the fact that Cognizant 
is investing in the future of AI. This is a direct investment in pushing the boundaries on AI technology. We have a team of AI PhDs. We're growing that team. We're doing core research, publishing in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. It's very important. So this is a big bet that Cognizant is making. I'm proud to be part of that. And it's unique. It differentiates us. And it follows a philosophy that we have within Cognizant, which is that the future is enterprises that are using AI pervasively and responsibly. And when you think about that and work back from what that means into what needs to be discovered, what needs to be invented, in enabling that, there's a lot. And we want to be leading that charge. And so this investment is directly towards that. And we already have a lot of differentiation. I think you may have seen in the announcement, we have more than 70 issued and or filed patents, actually 53 issued US patents um, in okay. this area. So we have a very strong head start. Thank you. Well, it was great talking with you. You're just you're in the mountains, I understand, where you yeah. live somewhere in California. <laughs> yes. So what can we wish you for the next years to come? What is your deepest wish? Uh, you know, when it comes to AI, we're seeing this myopic focus on using neural networks as in deep learning in a certain specific kind of architecture trained in a very specific way and used in a very specific way. And it's very, very powerful. But the majority, I would say 99.9% .9 of AI researchers are focused on that alone. And I think that will hurt us. Uh, I think if we don't expand out and diversify the way we look at AI and be creative about it, we will end up kind of stagnating in the AI world. So my wish is more investment and more breakthroughs that would actually allow us to use other types of approaches and improve on what we've achieved. We've achieved a lot, but I think we still have a lot of work ahead of us. So, so more investment, more diversity, and that's the way forward. Babak, yeah, thank you so. very much for this great discussion. Thank you for waking up so early to have a chat <laughs> with us. And we wish you the very best with your beautiful project. You take care. Thank you. A ja, pleasure. Ja. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. That's all for today's episode, where we brought you some of the latest and greatest from the training, technology, and innovation worlds. Thanks for listening. And thanks to our guests for sharing their valuable insight with us. If you struggle to capture the knowledge of your experts, contact us. We'll record engaging interviews with them for you to share. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our channel and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also find us on YouTube or LinkedIn, where you can watch the full video of this interview and many others. This interview was made possible thanks to Patrice Sejan of a powerful remote interview studio based on AI. Until next time, stay safe and stay insured. Cheers.